ladies and gentlemen, welcome into another episode of the New York Her Podcast presented by Visa. I'm your host, Olivia Landis. Just wanted to quickly thank you guys for each and every week stopping by, listening to the amazing guests that we have had so far, an entire season already. And now we're heading into this off season, going to continue to talk to some of the amazing women around the league and around sports in general. And this week, I have NFL.com columnist, Judy Batista. Judy, thank you so much for joining me. How's it going? Uh, it's great to be with you. Everything's good. Back from the Super Bowl and into the offseason. I have to know, because you were, you know, one of very, I feel like it was a little bit different this year with the Super Bowl. You yeah. were probably one of a, a small group of people who were lucky enough to go. How How was it like being out yeah. there in Tampa Bay watching Tom Brady win another Super Bowl? <laughs> um, the whole week was a little surreal because it was very different. Like there were not many reporters there at all. Um, maybe a few hundred, maybe not even that many, and obviously not many fans. Um, and the fans that were there, some of them were Bucks fans, so they weren't even traveling in. So the whole thing was much different than a normal Super Bowl. But um, you know, I mean, being at the game is always great. Like I still get a thrill uh, when I wake up on Super Bowl Sunday and realize I'm going to the Super Bowl. It's it's just a lot of fun, and obviously. You know, you know, you're watching two of the great quarterbacks of all time in this game, and and watching Brady win. I mean, I've you know we've seen it so much, but like I thought this one was particularly just like wow, what an accomplishment! <laughs> I mean, this one I think might have been his best one ever, given the circumstances around it. Um, it's he's just remarkable. Yeah, I, I can't even imagine sitting back and watching the game from a couch. I was like, wow, this this Super Bowl fe even feels a little bit differently. Yeah. on the TV. So I can't even imagine how different it must have felt in yeah. person. But Judy, I'd love to dive in a little bit to who you are and what you do as a career. Obviously, we just mentioned it. You are a columnist for NFL.com, but you wear a lot of different hats. We see you on a couple. We've seen you on a couple of different shows. Uh, we have you on some of our content at different times of the year. Um, so can you just give a quick breakdown to our listeners of exactly what it is that you kind of do throughout the entire year? <laughs> Um, well, as you mentioned, I'm a columnist, so that's number one. And then um, we are all also on the air on the NFL network. Um, so those two jobs sort of go hand in hand. They, they're together. They're not, neither, neither one is more important than the other. You do them sort of equal time. Um, and then you're right. Like I've been on the Jets uh, podcast and stuff like that, which is always a lot of fun because I go way back. I used to be the Jets beat writer for the New York Times. So I feel like I still have a, a strong connection to the New York Jets. Um, but, you know, you do a little of everything. I mean, during the season, you know, you're mostly, you know, straight on football. But um, in the off season, especially last off season, when they were scrambling just to figure out if there was even going to be a season, I mean, you know, there's no off season in the NFL. I mean, it's the part of the year when they don't play games, but the news does not really slow down. And so you're, you know, you're mostly reporting on news um, during the off season. You're, you know, and I suspect we'll be doing it again this year. I mean, obviously you have the sort of free agency and we're not going to have the combine this year, but pro days and free agency and the draft and those kinds of things. But then I think we're probably going to have a lot of news about like, what next season is going to look like. Like, are we going to be back to normal? Is there going to be an off season? Are we going to have free season games? All of those kinds of things. So um, it's a little bit quiet in the first few days after the Super Bowl, but that does not last very long. <laughs> yeah, don't let it fool you. I feel like no. oftentimes, I no. feel like oftentimes- You've got to so jam people... in your naps when you can because yes. it ends pretty quickly. Yes. Oftentimes people are always asking me, well, what do you do in the off season? Like oh, yeah, what's right. the off season like? And I'm like, well, boy, if I could just tell you what the off season is like, it's people still always at people always say that to me, like, well, now what do you do? And I'm like, well, <laughs> well I'm glad that you asked. It's crazier in the off season. So <laughs> at least the season has a rhythm, right? Like, you yeah, know, it's so is the players days off and then you get Sunday has the games, but like the off season is just bananas all the time. So uh, yeah, you know. Yeah, it's, it's definitely all over the place. Well, yeah. Judy, I'd love to dive a little bit deeper into your path and how you got to where you're at today. So let's first start off by when did you know that you wanted to pursue sports full time as a career? Um, well, I actually started as a news reporter. So I really first knew I wanted to be in journalism. Um, and that's what I studied at school. And that's and I my first job was at the Miami Herald. And I, I was in news. I was like a local news reporter um, covering uh, some of the 
towns around Fort Lauderdale, Florida. That's what I did. And I went to city council meetings and, you know, did cop checks and all of that kind of stuff. And, you know, the like big stories there were like, you'd go to the water board meetings where they would set the water rates. And that was a really big deal there because there were a lot of retirees who were on fixed incomes. And so if they raised the water rates, like that was a very big story for them. Um, so I started in news, but I'd always been a sports fan and always followed sports and things like that. And, um, you know, I just, at, at some point that like the assistant sports editor who was in the Broward County Bureau of the Miami Herald asked, you know, do, do you ever want to, have you ever thought about covering sports? And I had. Um, and so I just started doing some stuff occasionally, covered high school sports and things like that. And, um, and, and then one thing led to another and they had an opening and I, and I went to the sports department. And when I did it, I can't say, I never had these like a grand plan. Like, you know, when they always ask you in job interviews, where do you see yourself in five years? Where do you see yourself yeah. in 10 years? Like I never had that mapped out in my head. So even when I made the move to sports, I wasn't sure if that was going to be it. Like, okay, I'm in sports and I'm never going to leave sports again. Um, but it just worked out that way. I loved it. And I think um, being a sports writer, I think allows you to do a lot different kinds of reporting and writing that you can't do if you're a straight news reporter. Like you can do a lot more features as a sports writer. You can do a lot more analysis. You can have a little more fun with your writing um, that, you know, covering city councils just doesn't afford you the opportunity to do. So I loved it. And, um, and I just progressed through there. I covered the University of Miami football team, which was a blast because they were awesome at the time and had incredible players. And, um, and that probably spoiled me for covering, uh, you know, for covering sports after that. It was just fantastic. And then um, and then I moved to New York and I went to work for Newsday for two years and covered college hoops there, which was also a blast. I covered St. John's when they had run our test. And that was a blast as well. And then I um, and then I went to The New York Times and um, I covered a little bit of baseball and then I started covering the Jets. And that's how I got into covering the NFL, which has, which is by far my favorite thing that I've covered. Yeah, it's pretty incredible because you mentioned how you first started off in news. And believe it or not, you're actually not the first sports yeah, reporter. Yeah, yeah I've, I've actually come across quite a few individuals who first started off in news and then kind of um, transitioned into sports. So what I would love to know is how did first covering news and in a totally completely different world help prepare you in different areas of your career now? I think covering news is like the best possible background, no matter what kind of coverage you're going to go into. Um, first of all, I mean, let's face it, reporting is reporting. Um, it, you know, and when you're covering like a local news beat, you're often the only person at your paper who's responsible for covering it. So you got to do everything, right? I mean, like you've got to do the cop checks and you've got to get to know the city council members and you have to get to know your, um, you know, the local characters who make that city go and, um, you know, and the gadflies. And, and so it, it teaches you how to report um, and uh, teaches you how to talk to people. It teaches you how to develop sources. It, it also teaches you, I think, I mentioned, you know, going to the water board meetings, which certainly does not sound sexy in any way at all. But it also teaches you like what's important, like that you have to learn what's important to your audience. Um, at, like that, you know, I don't think any 24 year old reporter is like, woo, I can't wait to go cover a water board meeting. <laughs> but like it was a really important story to the people you were writing for, to, to your audience. And so I think you learned you know, that you have to, you know, you have to give people what is important to them, um, mm -hmm. whether you're excited about it or not. And um, I, and so I think all of that prepares you to be a good reporter, no matter um, what you ultimately end up covering. And I mean, you know, learning how to talk to police spokesmen, uh, you know, is important in sports, like learning how to get information um, from police is important no matter what you're covering. Learning how to develop sources and talk to people and ask people questions, just learning how to ask questions that elicit answers um, is an important skill. And, you know, you, you learn it no matter, no matter what you're doing. You, you, you mentioned something that I'd like to touch on because you said that 
even though it might not seem sexy as like a 24 year old to cover, you know, like you said, water rates, right. In um, at the time when you were down in Miami, but when you take that same approach, you said you have to give people what's important to them. So when you now look at what you do as a sports reporter and a writer, how do you determine what's important for people? What news people need to consume when it comes to sports? Because that's a little bit different than, like you said, um, a water bill, which people have to pay each and every month. Well, I think um, you, you have to figure out what's in, what fans want to read about, which is often, I, to be honest, the stars, uh, you know, especially casual fans care about the stars. I mean, that is, I think, one thing you learn when you cover football is the, the late, great New York Times columnist Dave Anderson told me when I first started covering football, like, when in doubt, write the quarterback. And that's true, right? Just like if you can't think of anything else to write that day and you've got to write something, write about the quarterback because everybody mm -hmm. cares about the quarterback, including, you know, the fans who are sort of fans in passing. Um, the most devoted fans will read about anything, including, you know, the backup guard. But, you know, the if you're trying to reach the broadest audience, which I think we all are, you, you, you got to, you know, you write about the stars. And I think that's, that is especially true in football. It's the quarterback. Um, sometimes it's, you know, Aaron Donald, somebody like that. But um, I think you have to give them a mix of that. And then you do have to give the sort of more hardcore fans what they want, right? And they will consume, you know, salary cap stuff, like, right, the real nitty gritty, you know, roster construction and, um, you know, salary cap space, what, you know, what the cap situation is going to look like, what the draft situation is going to look like, like, you got to give them that too. And I think, you know, you've, you've got to give, you got to produce a balance of that. You can't produce all, I don't, at least for me, I don't think you can produce all nitty gritty stuff. I don't think you can really do the hardcore X's and O's exclusively. I think there are some people who are, who just will not consume that. I think you got to give people some of that and then you got to give the feature story on the quarterback kind of stuff. Um, but again, I think, you know, what I learned just covering news, again, the water board meeting, like, you know, you've got to know your audience and you've got to know what they're interested in. And I, I don't think you have to give them only that, but you, you have to always have that in the back of your mind. Like, does anybody care? Like, I may find this story about the backup guard really interesting, but does anybody else care? I don't know. You know, and that's, I think, what you, you always have to have sort of in the back of your mind as you determine how you're going to cover something. And that's super interesting, too, because liter quite literally, your audience can kind of determine what you write, honestly, on a day to day basis. Of course, you as a writer have to determine, all right, what's important? What do the fans need to know? But also, like you said, you have to take into consideration what is what are people going to want to read about? What is going to interest people? Well, now that uh, we're diving a little bit deeper into your journey. Um, you've obviously, you mentioned how you, you've taken a lot of steps in your career. You even at one point were the Jets beat reporter for the New York Times. Um, yeah. I would love to know what are some of the obstacles that maybe you've had to overcome in your career that helped get you to be where you're at today and to get you to be the strong writer that you are, the strong presence that you are on television and just in the football world in general. Um, because, you know, we each go through obstacles that bring us to a point who we are as individuals and in our career, but you specifically, what are some of the things that you've had to overcome to get where you're at today? Well, first of all, I, I never had what I think you would think of as sort of a classic, like woman covering sports experience. Like I never had anybody try to throw me out of a locker room because I was a woman that never, I never had really had any players say I shouldn't be there. I was very fortunate. I always had sort of highly evolved bosses who had pretty diverse staffs. So I was never alone, number one. And I think I was always fortunate enough that I worked for relatively large um, news organizations. Like I worked for the Miami Herald, which was obviously the, the dominant newspaper in Miami. And um, and then I worked at the New York Times and now I work at the NFL Network. And so like, I, I think you sort of have a little bit more power um, or a bigger platform that people respect a little bit more. I've certainly had friends who have worked at smaller news outlets who have had a lot of trouble, you know, getting the respect of coaches and players. So I never had that kind of experience that everybody sort of thinks like, well, did you have that, you know, where somebody tried to throw you out? I didn't. But I think, um, I mean, certainly 
I think any woman in this business like has to sort of work a little bit harder to get your voice heard and uh, work a little harder to convince people that you know what you're talking about. Like that, I think, is the fundamental hurdle that, you know, I had to overcome. And I think most people have to overcome. Like, I think, you know, people think it's a given that guys know sports. Um you know, but that doesn't mean that I can't, you know, this is not like brain surgery that we're doing here. I mean, like I can know yeah. sports too. And one thing, you know, people will say, detractors will say, especially Twitter, this, there's a lot of this is like, you know, you never played it. How can you possibly know enough to write about it? And it's like, do you really think all of the men who write about football have played football at any kind of significant <laughs> level? Like, I know, right? <laughs> Um, like, no, uh, you know, I can, I could also write about, you know, do, do you really think that like, you know, people who cover the defense department have all served in the military? No, it, you know, that's, mm -hmm. it's not how that works. So, um, I, you know, I, but I do think that that's sort of the basic hurdle that you have to overcome as a woman in the business is, you know, you've got to, you've got to convince people that you know what you're talking about. And, and the, I think the only way you can do that is through your work, like you're, you know, you're, work has to be very strong. And, you know, I, I often, I have often felt like you better not make a mistake because if you make a mistake as a woman, that's how people are going to frame it. Well, of course she made a mistake. How could she know what she's talking about? She's a woman. Um, mm -hmm. So you probably have a higher standard that you have to, it's a higher bar that you have to reach for people to take you seriously. Yeah, I think, and like you said, I think that's a pretty common thing when it comes to <laughs> women in sports and with so many women that I've talked to in this podcast, that's definitely something we've always had as, as kind of the base of the discussion is there's a lot less wiggle room to make mistakes, you know? And like you said, your work has to be really strong. And I think it also has to be very consistent. I think that the work also has to be very consistent, like you said, in order to kind of gain that credibility, which as unfortunate as it is, it is the world that we live in today. But I wanted to um, make a comment because I think it's also important for our listeners to know that not every woman, like you said, has the same story. Not every woman has the same experience when it comes to being in the sports industry as a woman. Because you just mentioned, I don't have the same story that a lot of women do where, you know, I ran into uh, a lot of sexism or people or players being uncomfortable because I was a woman. So that's very good. And I think it's it's also important, as important as it is to talk about going through those experiences, it's also important to know that every woman's journey is different. And like you said, you didn't go through that, which is very, like you said, you felt fortunate and that's a good thing. So it's good to hear that some women don't go through those type of things, but it definitely is a standard like you said, to have to perform at a higher level to have that credibility. But you're here, you're here now. I would make the point that like, that is a continuing thing. Like you have to, and, it, I feel like you're, oh, I, I still have to convince people that I know what I'm talking about just as much as the guys do. Like that, I don't think ever really goes away. It, you know, no matter how far into your career yeah. you are and where you are, I mean, I still feel that I have to do that in my current job. And how far are you in like, like how many years have you been in the sports industry? Um, if you don't mind me asking. <laughs> so uh, I guess it's been third. It's almost 30 years now covering sports. Is that right? Yes, that is correct. It's almost and 30 you, years covering sports. And you still feel like you, you have to kind of almost prove yourself through your work, even after 30 years yeah. of doing excellent, excellent work. Yeah, because most of the decision makers, it's still an old boys club. And so you're still and having to overcome that, you know, the default position is that the guys know more about what they're talking about. I mean, there's just, that's just true. You you just have to deal with that. And um, I'm not sure that'll ever go away. Until, well, I was just you, get, until you get changes in the decision makers. That's the yeah. Well, I was just going to ask you, I mean, you kind of led me right into it. Do you think that that can change eventually? Like, what do you think it will take for that to change? Well, I think maybe not having, you know, all men producers at so many networks. I mean, at so many places you see that where it's all men producers and you sort of, some of them, you have to convince them that you know what you're talking about. I think, you know, if you had greater numbers of women in those positions. I think, 
you know, this goes without saying this is a universal in all workplaces. I think if you had greater diversity at the top decision making positions, you would, you know, you would have, they would bring their experiences to bear when they're making decisions and that would help. Um, but I think, you know, uh, look, as long as women are in the minority in sports reporting and, you know, we still very much are, the numbers are much better than they were even when I started, but you're still the minority. There's still many fewer of us in the press box than there are of men. Um, but so I, I think it, until it's much more balanced, um, I think that's going to be something you have to deal with. I mean, you just have to, you know, convince people that you know what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. And like you said, which as unfortunate as it is, it is sports. It is the sports yeah. world as, as we know it currently. But nonetheless, you have made quite the career for yourself. And being in sports for 30 years, some people might hear that and think, wow, do you ever get tired of writing or do you ever get tired of reporting? And that's my question to you. Are there ever times where you feel like um, it's the same thing? Or do you think when it comes to sports, it's something new each and every day? Yeah, I actually think that's one really good thing about covering sports is that it's constantly <laughs> changing. It's always something new. I mean, in a way, it's almost overwhelming, right? Because it's just like, especially the NFL. I mean, it's always something, right? There's always stuff happening. Um, so I actually think that you sort of stave off boredom. I don't think you get bored like that at all I'm, uh, covering sports. I mean, I, I, you know, we've covered Tom Brady now for 20, however many years it is, right? And you think like, well, all right, this is getting old. I'm running out of stuff. And then he changes teams and wins a Super Bowl in an entirely new setting. And so, you know, and Patrick Mahomes comes along. So, I mean, there's just, I think there's just this constant churn of stuff that keeps it fresh. So, uh, you know, I, I actually enjoy like the rhythm of the, I feel like the NFL season has more of a rhythm than any of the other seasons, but like, I actually enjoy the rhythm of the season and then the rhythms of the off season. Like, I think that keeps it fresh uh, for me at least. And because it's a relatively short season, in game season, um, and then, you know, you've got a pretty long off season. I actually, I like that balance because I briefly covered baseball before I went on to the jet speed. I covered the Mets and, you know, baseball is completely the opposite, right? Like it's like a million games and it's just constant game after game, after game, after game. And that I found to be more wearying because it was just the same thing every day, like another game, another game, another game. So I actually prefer the pace of the NFL where there's a game each week, but then there's all of that other stuff happening in the intervening days between games. I, I like that. And what have sports as a whole, since they've been in your life for such a long time now, what have they done for you both personally and professionally throughout the years? Oh, well, it's, I mean, look, it's given me my entire career. First of all, it's been great. Um, and for that matter, my husband's a sports writer too. So um, for both of us, so, I mean, it's bad. And, you know, it's also given me just amazing experiences that sometimes, you know, I sort of have to step back and think like, this is very cool. Like I was saying, you know, I still get excited when I wake up on Super Bowl Sunday and remember that it's the Super Bowl um, and I'm going to it. it, you know, like that's just, uh, you know, that's just yeah. an incredible experience that most people don't get. And, you know, like my neighbors will say like, are you going to the Super Bowl? And like, that sort of reminds me like, this is very special. Like, and you just don't, get these opportunities. People, other people don't get these opportunities. Um, and you sort of have to remind yourself not to take it for granted, but that's what sports has given me. I mean, and I've seen incredible things up close. I mean, like I, you know, I covered Michael Jordan's flu game. <laughs> like I just happened to be covering that night. So like yeah. these, these things that, you know, people talk about years later. Yeah. I think um, as, even though there are obstacles, especially as women in sports, like you said, it, it just, it, it gives you such an incredible, incredible experiences. It really does because I think sometimes, well, I'll speak for myself. I can't speak for everyone else, but I think sometimes we get in such a, a rhythm or I get in such a rhythm and a routine and, and you forget when you're at a game or when you're covering a game, like, wow, this is really special. Not yes. everybody gets to do this, yes. you know, because you kind of get used to it. But when you take a step back, like you said, you realize this is something super special and something that I should really cherish because not everyone gets to do stuff like that. Yes, I agree. I think, um, 
you know, I have to remind myself of that because you get tired, especially at the edge of the season. You're just like, oh, God. Yeah, you're like, oh, but, um, right, crawling, crawling to the end line. Um, but again, like, you know, when you get up on Super Bowl Sunday and you remember, like, I'm going to go to the Super Bowl today and not many people get to do that. Like, that's pretty cool. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, I actually, you mentioned that your husband is a sports writer as well. I'm, I'm, I would love to know, do you guys ever go back and forth on writing styles or anything like that? Because I feel like if you're both doing the same thing at times, you have to run into each other with, with the work at times, right? Yeah. Well, he covers baseball, so we have not overlapped that much, but we definitely like read each other's stuff and, you know, talk about story ideas and edit each other's copy. Like, yes, we definitely do that. Um, but, you know, we only overlapped briefly on baseball, just, the, you know, literally a few months. But and so we have not overlapped on the sports, which is probably a very good thing. Um, <laughs> it, it also makes sure like it makes your travel schedule sort of crazy when he was on the Yankee beat and I was covering the Jets as a beat, like, you know, you'd be on these sort of opposite seasons. Like my season would come to an end and literally spring training would open like, you know, four days later. So you'd be like, oh, okay, here we go. Right into the next. Yeah. Um, so I can't imagine both of us when, you know, I can't imagine if both of us covered the same sport, that would be very strange because then I don't think you'd ever be home at the same time. It would be very odd. Yeah, I think it would. Yeah. All right. Well, I have one more question for you before I let you go on the podcast. What is one piece of advice that you would offer to share with not just young women, but young journalists coming up in the industry who hope to make a difference in the sports world? Wow. I, I would say don't feel bad about starting small. Like I really believe in the value of covering high school sports, um, for example, or covering like community sports or community news. Like I know we all want to write for the big publications or we all want to be on TV. Like everybody wants to have the big, big job. But I actually think you learn the most at those early you know, entry level jobs. Like that's where, again, that's where you learn to interview people. That's where you learn how to cultivate trust and cultivate sources. And that's where you learn to like generate story ideas. Um, and, and so I would say, don't, don't be afraid to, to take a job like that. It's, it's great to cover high school sports for a little bit. It teaches you a ton um, about, you know, how to talk to people. And that's really all this job is, is like how to talk to people and how to gain people's trust so, so that you can learn stuff from them that you can then convey to your audience. Um, so that would be my advice for, for young journalists is like, don't be, we're all in a race to get the big job. Everybody wants the big job, but like those entry level jobs are really, really valuable. Amazing. Well, Judy Batista, a columnist for NFL.com. Thank you so much for your time and for coming on to the New York Her podcast presented by Visa. I appreciate you. And listen, we look forward to reading more of your work and seeing you on the TV. Thank you so much, Judy. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. That's a wrap on another episode of the New York Her podcast presented by Visa. Please listen, subscribe and share the podcast to every single person we know. I want to thank you guys for the support week in and week out. I know we've had some amazing guests. It's just going to continue throughout the off season. So thank you this week to Judy Batista from NFL Network. We'll see you guys next time.